Comprehensive, relevant, and insightful conversations about health and medicine happen here on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Diabetes affects 34 million Americans and is growing yearly. Because of their disease, many people with diabetes will struggle with wounds that just won't heal, sometimes resulting in amputation. But according to the CDC, as many as 85% of potential amputations could be avoided with advanced treatment such as hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBO. Here to talk more about this is Dr. David Zachary Martin, Regional Medical Director of the MedStar Health Wound Healing Institute here in Baltimore. I'm your host, Mike Shu. Welcome to Doc Talk. And Dr. Martin, welcome to you. Thanks for having me, Mike. So HBO, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, how does this help people? You know, as you and I sit here, uh, we're breathing air, which has about 21% oxygen in it. Mm-hmm. Um, if, uh, somebody brought in a, a face mask for us, they could get us breathing hundred <laughs> percent oxygen. Um, uh, but the way that that oxygen is delivered to different parts of our bodies is through the cells in our blood. And even the cells are limited by how much oxygen they can deliver when we're breathing hundred percent oxygen by using hyperbaric oxygen. That's where we pressurize the body we can force the oxygen not just into the cells, but into the fluid of our blood and dissolve the oxygen and substantially increase the delivery of oxygen to other parts of our body that need it. Well, both at that time or any residual effects that saves them for a little bit longer? Or? Yeah, good question. So uh, it happens in the moment and, and for some, you know, an hour or so after the, the treatments and then slowly dissipates. Um, but there are other things that happen with that oxygen treatment Uh, the most obvious being the delivery of oxygen, but actually it's the pulsing of that oxygen that can stimulate healing and new blood vessel formation in the body. So for some, um, and and help me with this, for some wound patients, do some of them just get some oxygen? Does that help? Or if you're going to do that at all, let's put them in the hyperbaric chamber. Using just oxygen, like on a face mask or something like that, that that really has not been demonstrated to be very helpful. So if, if we determine uh, after all the treatments that we uh, have have reviewed with the patient, that hyperbaric oxygen is going to be part of their of their treatment plan. We really want to get them uh, pressurized and uh, on a treatment course that'll last se- several weeks. And how long will they be? Would they be in the chamber? So uh, typical treatment is about two hours, yeah. and it's um, Monday through Friday, five days a week. Typical treatment course is twenty treatments, so you're looking at four weeks. Uh, Continue, uh, steady straight through and and really to get the best benefit you need to stick with the program so you're asking for a substantial commitment from the patient to be there you know two hours a day plus or minus their mute time and uh, it's going to be uh, something that only somebody that can really commit to getting all the treatments it's is, would it be appropriate for are the patients at that point though they're looking for some relief because they have some wounds that are just not healing right. So you is the, the take rate, so to speak, the, the people who agree to do this, is it relatively high? It, uh, it is not necessarily relatively high. So, uh, you know, w- when we are working up the uh, a patient for hyperbaric oxygen, we're, we're first going through sort of all the basic things. So 85% of patients that we treat for wounds should respond to really basic treatments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so once we get and find out those that 15% of patients that need these specialized treatments, you know, then we start looking at hyperbaric oxygen. We have to see if they're medically appropriate for it. And then we have to see if they can, they can make the treatments. So how do patients develop wounds in the first place? So uh, chronic wounds can come from a number of factors. Uh, in the diabetic population, uh, it's usually from uh, repetitive trauma. It could be just from a single injury, but usually there's a you know irregular wear in their shoe. Uh, uh, diabetes can cause over time structural changes in the foot that make the bones more prominent, and uh, over time, just by the just by the act of walking, uh, these ulcers can form. And what is it about having diabetes that makes it harder for wounds not to heal? Yeah, so diabetes uh, impacts our whole body. Uh, It impacts our cells. It impacts our nerves. It affects our large blood blood vessels, and it affects our small blood vessels. We call that the microvascular. And uh, that's where it can really impact the delivery of oxygen to tissues. 
We were talking about the the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, um, and you said that it was pressurized. What do you mean by pressurized? Yeah, so uh, if if you've ever been scuba diving and you go uh, you go underwater and you feel a little pressure on your ear, that's your body being pressed by the, uh, the in this case the pressure of uh, of the water in the chamber. It's the pressurized oxygen. It, the chamber's how big? Chamber's uh, about forty eight inches in diameter. It's a big glass tube. Okay. Uh, and so if you come in for treatment uh, and you're going to be there for two hours, we want to make sure you have something to do. Uh, <laughs> so we have TV monitors uh, over the over the chambers and uh, some people will bring uh, movies to watch or will watch TV. Uh, so it's a big glass tube that they can they can see through. We um, we have a communication system. There's a there's a nurse or a tech sitting by them the whole time to communicate with. And then that is they're, they're sealed in there. Mm hmm. And it's, is it pressurized with sort of uh, the air that we're breathing now, or is it extra special air that has more it, oxygen it's, in it? Uh, yeah, slowly <laughs> pressurized with uh, 100% oxygen. 100%. Yeah. And so they're breathing uh, the oxygen, and that's where it gets uh, goes through their lungs and gets dissolved into their blood and then is you know delivered throughout their body. Is that a different sensation for them than you know sort of being out in you know, the normal world? Uh, yeah, as some patients will feel the the pressure uh, as they're as they're being pressurized. Mm -hmm. They may need to clear their ears if you've ever had your ears pop on an on an airplane. Yeah. Um, and uh, some patients will, you know, once they get their ears cleared, will, they are at pressure. They don't really notice because the pressure change. It's the pressure change that they mm -hmm. notice. Um, and I've I've had patients both report to me that they feel incredibly energized after a treatment. And then I've had others that feel like they're ready for a nice, heavy sleep. <laughs> really? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, different responses. So is it about the same sort of, it, it, I, when you, when you're up in an airplane, you're actually sort of depressurized. Uh, yeah. but is it, is it that same sort of ratio of, of, uh, you know, pressurization that they would feel similar to an airplane? Yeah, it's right because it's the change in pressure. And so, uh, that, that, the the slower that changes, the more comfortable it is, and so even for patients that that are feel are more sensitive to that pressure change, we might actually change the rate of uh, of pressurization for them. Right. And you pressurize it and depressurize it over the course of how many minutes? Uh, about twenty minutes. Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah, the only reason the babies cry is at the beginning of the flight right. and at the end. You got it. That's that's where the, when the pressure <laughs> changes. In the middle, they're fine. That's um, right. So it's it's not altogether that uncomfortable of an experience for them. No. Uh, it's, it's, it's very well tolerated, uh, once you've, once you've sort of mastered the pressurization process and the, the, the process of sort of forcing the air into the body that in and of itself helps the body to heal. Yeah. So, so different, uh, yes, different, um, parts of our body respond differently to oxygen. So the blood vessels that have been starved of oxygen at on a foot in somebody with vascular disease, the pulsing of that higher level of oxygen and then that level of oxygen then going back down again stimulates the formation of new blood vessels to grow. Really? And so you, you're getting the immediate impact of delivering oxygen but then the sustained impact over time of actually growing new blood vessels that can promote healing. So when I think of the word pulsing, I think of something happening relatively fast. Are you talking about pulsing in the sense of a two hour session as a pulse? Thank you. Yes. It, each day would be, you know, one, each treatment would be one episode of that higher oxygen level and, um, and the body sensing sort of the higher and then lower oxygen levels is, is what it's responding to. Yeah. So 20 days over the course of a month, that is a big commitment. Yes, for sure. Uh, and some treatments can extend beyond it. We find that for the cellular changes that we're talking about, the blood vessel growth, you need to at least get 10 treatments to really see that benefit. Well, then, then how do you measure improvement? You've, they've done their 20 days. How do you know if it's doing any good? That's everything, right? That's why that's why we're there. So the simplest form is a quantitative measurement of the wound size. So if we're treating a, a open wound, uh, we're measuring it on a weekly basis, and we want to see that we've, we're demonstrating that it's that it's getting smaller. Yeah, I mean, are wounds like that? The open wounds are they 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 usually covered with you know a salve or a dressing or something or. Yep. Um, often they'll have a dressing. There's certain dressing materials that we have to keep out of the chamber because it just 
kind of gooks up the chamber. So, <laughs> but the dressing is sort of an un, unimportant part during sure. the during the treatment. So the, the, when they're doing they're doing their their dressing changes halfway through or three quarters of the way through, they may even themselves go. This looks better. Yes, uh, we would say that uh, encourage patients to really not prejudge it in the first ten days because we just know that it, that's that's what it takes to just kind of rev things up. But we would hope by week three or four that they can see for themselves that there's a benefit. So then, would one session, let's say we've been using this example of twenty, mm-hmm. is that enough sometimes to do the trick? and get people to a point where their their wounds are better and they're stable and yes one 20 treatment session can be enough we may at the end of those 20 treatments say you know this is looking better your body clearly is responding but we may need to extend uh, your treatments and other people we may they may be looking so good that we can discontinue any type of patient that is particularly well suited for this and are there any that you know you already know this might not work for them yeah, so um, you know we we get a lot of calls for hyperbaric oxygen treatment because there's a lot of information on the internet about it. It is sometimes talked about like it's a magic bullet treatment for things, um, and so we really like to talk in the context of you know this is just using oxygen like you'd use a, a drug. You know, sometimes it's appropriate to put you on antibiotics. Sometimes it's not appropriate to put you on antibiotics, and just because it sounds good to be delivering. Sure. Uh, oxygen, it's uh, it's not always helpful. So uh, our hardest job uh, in practicing hyperbaric medicine is really picking the right candidates because if you treated everybody, it would look like it never worked because it's only going to help uh, certain people with specific problems. One common application we have for it is following reconstructive surgery. Uh, when we do reconstructive surgery, sometimes the tissues aren't healing perfectly because we've uh, repositioned the blood supply of that of that tissue, and so those are those are patients that we expect to respond well to hyperbarics. Uh, the diabetic patients need to be really well managed. Uh, diabetics they need to be getting great wound care, yeah. uh, and other aspects of their care need to be good uh, in order for them to see to see that benefit. So really finding um, finding the right patient, uh, sparing the patients that aren't good candidates from uh, coming to our clinic for a month <laughs> for two hours is is a benefit in of, itse- of itself for them. When you say the reconstructive patient, you're not mm-hmm. necessarily talking about someone with poor circulation or a diabetic. You're talking about a different kind of re- you know, sort of someone who is uh, average or normal in other ways. Yes. Uh, so uh, it applies in both scenarios. So uh, in the limb salvage patient or limb preserving patient who's had their blood flow restored mm-hmm. uh, and is now getting reconstructive surgery to close a wound, um, we will be altering some of that blood supply by doing the surgery. So we're the, the, those tissues can get compromised in that process. But even in um, procedures like breast reconstruction, uh, where you know there isn't a chronic medical condition that's contributing to poor healing, you can experience poor healing, and uh, that's due to alterations in the blood supply that are basically caused by the surgery. And uh, hyperbaric oxygen can help those patients as well. What also strikes me it's a it's a limited resource, right? You don't. It's not like you have. Dozens and dozens of these, or, or, or is this a, a case where it is at different centers, or is there one place where you focus the attention? Yep. So we have uh, we have four chambers. Uh, we're generally able to accommodate people that people that need this. So it's not something that we feel like we have to triage uh, patients. If somebody's a good candidate, we're going to find mm-hmm. a way to get them to get them in. So has this been credited with saving any patients who come to the wound center from having to have an amputation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you, so we're following these patients, except in the case of the of these uh, reconstructive patients where you're sort of urgently getting them in because there's yeah. some some compromise. For these these wound patients, uh, hyperbaric oxygen becomes this treatment that is offered after you've ruled out and implemented all these other things. So these are people that you've been uh, really doing every evidence based treatment that you know of, and you and you get to the end of your of your 30 days of treatment or 60 days of treatment and you, and you're not moving the needle enough. And that's when hyperbarics can have a, can have a role. Um, so it, it, that is the, the next question, which is, you know, at what point is wound care treatment plan with HBO introduced? And it, it depends is what I hear. Uh, 
it depends, but the, the, it's the important thing is, uh, you know, we, when you, when you're practicing medicine and you, you're in medical school, you get, get into the trauma bay. And the first thing that the trauma surgeon tells you is don't, don't be fooled by the distracting injury. You know, the thing that's staring at you. So, you know, always stick to the basics of, mm-hmm. of medical care. And so, uh, that's what it is with wound care. So I, you know, I think if you, if a, somebody comes in with a, with a wound and the first thing I'm thinking is hyperbaric oxygen, I'm, I'm missing a lot of steps in there. And most patients are going to respond to those basic steps and not need the hyperbaric oxygen. It's these outliers that benefit the most from it. It's funny you say basic because in some way it's a, it's a very basic treatment. You're just talking about oxygen and pressure, but yet you're respecting all the other things you have to get, yep. get there first. Yeah. You're right. Um, when they're in the chamber, um, other than the pressure differential and their ears may pop or something, does, does the patient feel anything in the wound area? I don't get a consistent answer from my <laughs> patients on this, so I, I don't want to uh, to be misleading in my answer. But yes, I've heard patients, you know, they, they feel like it's getting better. Um, and I don't know whether they're noticing that or not or if whether that's an impression. That's fine, right? uh, well, it's really important uh, for wound care patients to – uh, to have a positive attitude about the process they're in because living with a chronic wound is a, is a terrible burden for patients. Mm-hmm. And so if, if that can be part of them getting better, then that's, then that's great. But we're really focused on sort of our objective measures of their success. Um, I just want you to wrap up and run through again um, what it is and what it's used for and how it helps people. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen is uh, a, a method for delivering high levels of oxygen to tissues in the body. And we primarily use it in the wound center for non-healing wounds, either from uh, chronic medical conditions or surgical wounds. It is also used for things like decompression illness in in scuba divers. uh, And we don't perform that at our uh, center. It typically requires a slightly different type of, uh, of chamber. Doctors always like to have as many tools as they can in their toolbox, and this is just one of the ones that you're using to try to get these people healthier and happier and their wounds to just close up and become well. I couldn't have said it better. It's a tool, and it's one tool, and it's uh, you need everything when you get to the patient that is not responding to your standard treatments. We have this group of treatments that we offer, which I, when I'm yeah. talking to the residents, we call it advanced modalities. And this is an advanced modality. This is where you, this is the next level of, of care for really refractory wounds. Yeah. And, and that's good that the MedStar Health has a team to put together to try to have the best possible outcomes for people who have these, these difficult conditions. So we've been talking with Dr. David Zachary Martin at MedStar Franklin Square Medical Center. Dr. Martin, thank you for sharing your expertise here on MedStar Health Doc Talk. To request a consultation at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital or MedStar Franklin Square Medical Center, call 888 888- 83 wound w o u n d that's 888-839-6863 or visit medstarhealth.org